So the first question I would raise, and Sheffield University did a really interesting study called the Bugs Project many years ago. And it was really interesting. Oliver Gilbert was involved, uh, one of the talks about the little book. Um, and he quietly said to me, well, I don't know what they're doing in terms of botany. Oliver was helping to verify some of the plant identification. He was a bit of a stickler for his lichens and his bryophytes. Um, but they had a fundamental problem. When they, got, they did this really interesting scientific work, but they had a problem publishing it because they were dealing with biodiversity in a garden. Hmm, what's a garden? How big is it? Where does it end? It's a human cultural attachment. That's Sir Charles Burrell's little pad. That's Net Castle. And that's his garden. And I think it's a Paxton landscape and all sorts of stuff. It's, it's very pleasant. He has two castles, he lives in one of them. Very nice. But that's his garden. If I'm the Duke of Devonshire, I've got a wacky great garden. How can I compare the ecology? How can I actually address that and uh, evaluate it? It becomes quite a problem. So what is a garden? And the garden can be a window box, it can be a net castle. This has implications for rewilding or wilding. So some rewilding projects are enormous, many are very large, but they're not restricted to mega sites. They're just the ones that we hear about. For success on the individual sites, we also need to apply rewilding principles widely and at all scales. And this comes into the later thing I'm going to talk about. Because everybody can take part, everybody can do their bit. So from micro to macro, you know, you can change the world. Someone sent me a, a video of, a, of his garden, his front garden, um, just south of Chesterfield, at Wingworth. So go on to my I think I put it on my Twitter or in my blog, I can't remember which. But it looks like that and it's just it's just absolutely amazing. And he's just transformed his front garden. And it's full of bees. Now admittedly he's he's in an ordinary semi-detached house, but he has got a beehive there as well, which <laughs> is stuck on his roof. But the place is absolutely humming. You can do it. Now the consequence of scale is important in this because Small sites need more intensive intervention and habitat creation. So the small site, you, you actually have to be prepared to do quite a lot to achieve what you want. Large sites like NEP, and like some of the other big <coughs> and other states are doing at the moment, can use naturally based processes to generate scrub and new natural woodland. So you can kind of just change your management and let nature get on with them. What they did at NEP was they introduced longhorn cattle, as a sort of marker, if you like, for uh, the extinct wild European aurochs, a big heavy grazing herbivores, and they introduced Tamworth pigs that did the job of what wild boar used to do. So they would go around and they spread fungi and they spread plant seeds. And what they generated was a fantastic recovery in what had been a really crummy landscape. So on a big site, you can actually let nature get on with it, on a small site, you can't. It doesn't work. You've got to really think about what you want. So, why are gardens so? Well, why are we here? Why are gardens so important? It's well, there's about 15 million or more private gardens in Britain. Now, if we can harness just a proportion of that, you suddenly start. You're starting to change the world. You're starting to put in the bits in between the bigger projects, and you're starting to showcase this for uh, other people. You know, how many people are going to experience this rather than people that maybe go to NEP or somewhere like that? About 15% or more when it's growing of England and Wales is urban. So that becomes again uh, an important driver. The other thing I would say is that don't think that the non urban bits are all good for nature because some of them are dire, absolutely desperate. <laughs> Um, which is a separate discussion, a separate argument. Because when we're talking about overdevelopment, as I was involved with a campaign at Althorpe near Crystal Peaks, the problem there is that the bit that they were building on was actually really good for nature. <laughs> they said, so they're, not, they're tending not to be building in the really crummy bits, the bits that have already been damaged. Um, but often the development is in the little bits that are still very, very good. So 
in terms of the gardens and nature, think about how many people are gardeners and how we can actually get people with gardening skills to think, just think about how to do things differently. But also the number of visitors that you get to those gardens, the, the, the potential for these to showcase nature to an interested community is really, really significant. And you get contact with nature and nature therapy. This goes back to the lockdown thing. At the moment I'm trying to develop a connection with the St. Luke's Hospice, for example, to develop nature contact um, for end of life, but also for people that are caring for end of life and that sort of thing. So, there's all sorts of things you can do, and it, it makes a huge difference to people to be able to see nature, to be able to um, experience nature, mentally and physically, it's really good for us. So, we need to think about approaches to this. This is what I call hard wilding. If you go down to Glasgow on a Saturday night, you can be hard wilded if you care. Um, but we also talk about soft wilding. Now we talk about actually not necessarily the purest thing, not, we're not necessarily into reintroducing wolves and brown bears and eagles. You can do things in a much more moderate, modest way. And a lot of it's happening anyway. A lot of, you know, nature, given a chance, is starting to rewild itself. I've, I live on the edge of Sheffield, I've had barn owls displaying over my garden in a suburb of South Sheffield and they're nesting in the valley nearby. We've got foxes and badgers visiting every night. We've got uh, buzzards, sparrowhawks, peregrine. <coughs> that's actually trophic levels, that's nature self rewilding So this was Chris's, I'm not sure if this is the original one or this is the thing, this is probably the original one, How to Make a Wildlife Garden. This actually kick-started a lot of these approaches uh, back in the that's the new version, that's it, I knew it was that, yeah. There's Chris, he looks a little bit younger when he wrote the other one. Uh, and he actually opened the first wildlife garden here in the Botanical Gardens with the Friends of the Earth. Does anyone remember the Friends of the Earth Botanical Garden, the wildlife garden here? It was, in the, it was put into the most unfavourable, out of the way bit of the government garden because the, the actual people in charge really didn't want us there at all. It was it's far too untidy. But it kind of was a starting point of fact. It's just, and what Chris would say is just get a foot in the door. Just, just make a start. Um, and that was the, the later one that he launched with the Royal Horticultural Society. And it's a direct connection to the godfather of Victorian gardening, William Robinson, <coughs> who wrote a fantastic book on the wild garden. And I'm sure you're all aware of this. It's a wonderful book. Um, and he advocated a wild garden with exotic species like giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, giant knotweed, <laughs> Himalayan balsam and rhododendron, naturalised into the uh, remote parts of the Bonds of State. It's, it's caused a lot of problems. <laughs> they are fantastic species because they are stunning in the garden. I've grown Himalayan uh, giant hogweed in my garden. My wife thought I was wrong because I did get a wonderful scar, which I'm, at some point I'm going to put on the internet because I monitored it, photographing it. Because you get a photosensitive scar if you uh, brush yourself on the giant hobby. It was quite exciting. <laughs> uh, this is where he lived, Brave Time Manor. Very, very pleasant. And he was one of the ones who pioneered this sort of herbaceous gardens and the wilder areas and the shrubberies and the alpine and rock gardens and things. Absolute hero. And these sort of beds of um, ice plants and alliums, etc. And the, the mass plantings that you see in these wonderful houses. Uh, I mean, so to me, this is gardening with nature in mind. This is where somebody starts. It's just tweaking it towards what we're trying to do now. And then, of course, the other person who was very influential was Gertrude Jekyll. And she really pioneered the sort of cottage garden, sort of English herb, herbaceous garden approach. And you can see her own house at various stages in its prime, and then down to the middle one where it's neglected, and then 
uh, restored later in the 20th century. And the thing with Gertrude Jeet is that she was short-sighted, so she couldn't really see. So she, her vision was these massed colours and massed phantoms because she couldn't see the detail. So you should always half close your eyes when you're planning what you're going to do. Because it is absolutely, you know, it's delightful. And what you've also got, you've all the, you've all the habitats, you've got the, the walls and the rockeries and lots of little places for uh, different plants to colonise in, for ferns, for lichens, for mosses and for invertebrates. It's an absolute wildlife paradise but in a glorious garden setting. So one of the things that gardening is about is creating habitats. But well, we need to think about nature, we want to be inspired by nature. But obviously what you can achieve depends on where you are and what you've got and how much you've got. But even if you've only got a small garden, you may be able to get your hands on a community wild space. And we are doing some work to say we're hoping to set up a, a project maybe for next year based here at the Botanic Gardens where we can have maybe monthly workshops. And one of the people that's kind of inspired me to that, unfortunately couldn't come today, she was booked, is Barbara Masters, who's a local council, and she's been working with community groups to, to set up wild areas. Uh, and she's got a policy change from City Council and from Amy as the contractors to enable this to happen. But the idea is to go back to nature and look at nature and think, what can I take from this? What inspiration can I take from this in my garden? So things that you can do, you can look at uh, planting trees and shrubs, you can look at introducing herbs, perennials and annuals, grasslands and meadows. Now grasslands and meadows are interesting because you have to be very careful about where you are. The soil type becomes important but also the your aspect becomes important. So if you're on an north facing slope, don't bother with a sunny meadow, an animal meadow or something like that. It's not on a cornfield. Uh, annuals area, it's not going to work. You will be looking at a woodland edge type meadow and you need to have a species appropriate to that. If you're in a very dry hot sunny location then that's great, you can go for a, a straightforward meadow or for an annual type mix. But you need to think where you are and what you are and what's possible. Um, and you need to think about creating water. And water, people worry about water because obviously it can be a hazard, but you can have water even in a situation where you want to really make it totally safe. There are ways of doing that, you just need to think cleverly. And then other features can also be added. Location, location, location is very, very important. This is where we live. I always have to kind of refocus really on this. Is that one there? That's my wildlife garden. So we've got, no, it's not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's oh, I know what it is. That's, that, that's, yeah, one of those trees has come down in my neighbour's garden. I think it's probably that one which went straight through us. Yeah. So that's where we are. And the thing there is, you've got all these gardens around. This is where my badges are coming from. There's a badger set somewhere down in those gardens there. But then also, we've got this lovely green area here, which is Oaks Park, and there's a big water body there. Um, so that's a, that's a wonderful location. I mean, you know, you can go to Google Earth and you can see where you are um, and decide what's appropriate and where. So aspect. Altitude exposure. You have to be, think about realistically where you are. Well, we're at Norton. My God, it's cold there. You're on top of the hill. We can look out the window in winter and you think, when I was working on a daily basis, well, I can't get into work today. You get to the end of the road and it's like it's summer. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're under snow and there's no traffic moving, but a short distance away, it's a problem. Um, and obviously exposure can be quite an issue. So you need to think realistically about uh, where you are. So meadows, meadows are fantastic. If you've got the conditions, they are wonderful. They become easier the more space you've got and in a nice sunny location. This one is a sunny location but with a, um, a damp layer. There are spring lines in this part of Sheffield. Uh, and there's water coming out of the surface. 
or it might be a little space on a relatively neglected uh, roadside village. This is in Huntsfield, and there's a little bit of greenery as you drive through Huntsfield. And the man with the mower has simply missed out where the birds put trap on one of those. So good on him. It looks a bit weird because it looks like it's been a, an extremely bad haircut, but it's a fantastic little bit of habitat. And that over time will grow if you get more diversity and more species, you know, more uh, extent. And it's the food plant for a number of butterflies like columbian butterflies. So I would expect maybe a chance of, of those establishing there. So you can do it in you know, quite moderate areas. That's my neighbour's front garden. Um, and I think it'll be later on that I'll show you a bit more of that. And none of that has been artificially seeded. Uh, and it's just come up by itself. I've actually added with his permission this year this little plant, the yellow rattle, uh, which is one that's been used extensively by the biodiversity officers for Sheffield City Council for rewilding uh, meadow areas, yeah, introducing green hay and just scattering it onto park grassland. And I'll show you some pictures later. It, its impact has been dramatic. And what this does, it's quite a nice little yellow flower, it's quite attractive if understated but it parasitises the roots of grasses. So it plugs its roots into the grasses and then they reduce in stature and they're not as aggressive, they're not as dominant, so the wildflowers do better. So the grasses are appropriate, you want grasses in there, but you don't want them dominating. So you try to use this as what we call an ecological architect. It's a, a, a species that drives the ecological system. And I introduced that to his front lawn, so I'm going to see what happens this year. So, I think this one might... This is this chap's front lawn, and it came about because cattle from Oaks Park, about 10 years ago, broke out and were pursued by the police up the lane, back in the park, down the lane, up the lane, back in the park. It was quite funny. And they trampled through his front lawn. And then he finally got a few orchids came up, so no ground them. He's not a botanist, he's not a wild one. And then he got them all, they no ground those. And he has now got an absolutely amazing <coughs> show of orchids. 15 million private homes. You know, we can have a huge impact. And this year, the orchids have spread onto the roadside where there's opposite where his front lawn is. And his front lawn is just, it's, it's an open plan 1970s garden on the corner of our lane. So, it's just, it just gives you an idea of what the potential is and why are we not doing that more widely. So meadows can do really, really good, really work. And I mean, the orchids are the ones that everyone gets excited about there, but there's also sedges and other flowers uh, growing in that sward as well. It looks really, really good. The other habitat, and again, it depends where you are, and this might be in quite a small garden, if you're on the north facing slope, quite shady, slightly damp. Um, you need to think about the woodland edge, what are the species that are growing in you know, woodland edge? And then what conditions can you create? And that might be planting uh, fairly quick growing smaller trees like rowan and birch and things like that, or hazel. You can create the right habitat quite quickly. And introducing uh, more interesting woodland flowers. This is the very rare herb paris which I have to say I did acquire legitimately from a rare plant fair and it's now doing really well. And if in future there's some sort of catastrophe and my house is wiped out, preferably when I'm not there, um, we have an old oak tree at the top of the garden and it now has her paris and bluebell and various sort other of woodland flowers and ecologists will come along and say, oh, this is the size of a once ancient woodland. Because that is the top indicator species for ancient woodland. And it's a fantastic thing. Uh, Paris quadrifolia. And we did a little video clip for one of our projects on uh, the Ancom Valley where we're doing a climate change project. Went into a local woodland, brought them wood, and there's a fantastic standard that's there. So I'm on camera talking about 
how it has four leaves, Paris quadrifolia, four leaves. They've all got five leaves, the bastard things. <laughs> <laughs> so, water is the other thing that you want, if you can get it. Um, obviously, if your garden has access to small children, or your small children have got access to your garden, you need to think very carefully about health and safety. Um, you should have a, a sloping route into the pond um, for wildlife and for safety reasons. But you want it as deep as possible. That's the, the bigger pond at the top of the garden. It's actually bigger than it looks like. It's kind of foreshortened. Um, and in the middle, that's about five foot deep. And the reason is that you want stability. So that doesn't dry up even during the drought period and it doesn't freeze through during the cold winter. If you've got a shallow water body, it's going to be different because it will dry and it will freeze. So you need to think about that. You know, they also require brutal management to stop things like the marsh marigolds and the greater spearwoods and stuff completely taking over. And then the other thing that we've got here, and I don't think I've got a picture of it, uh, is that we have a very rare newt which I wrongly assumed when I found them was great crested newt because it's about that long, mm -hmm. turn it over and it's bright yellow underneath and it's got other sort of markings on it. and it's got a warty back and it, but it didn't feel right and I, I found the larvae and the larvae didn't feel right for great crested newt but I've had smooth newt before and I've got you know, a palmating down in the pond before it's a long one that's well up in the pond Oh, this is a monster. Turns out that we've got one of the only established colonies of uh, alpine newt, which is like a smaller cousin of uh, great crested newt. So it's an invasive, non native species, and we just happen to be in the epicentre of one of its very few British populations. And I've now got somebody on the other side of um, Chesterfield Road over towards Greenland who's got it in their garden as well. And the problem now is I have no frogs. <laughs> because these are a bit like something from Jaws. Um, when I, I put some frog spawn in there, you know when the, the tadpoles come out and they're on top of the jelly and they're sort of all wriggling? Well, this is like Jaws. <laughs> and they ate every larva, every tadpole within a day, and none left. So I now no longer have many frogs. Smooth newts will eat tadpoles as well, but they're not anything like as voracious as these blooming things. And I thought I'd got a specially protected species as well. <laughs> but where, you, where you've got water, you've got life. And it's the basis of lots of food chains. And also things like the birds. You know, the birds love the ponds. Starlings, sparrows, and blackbirds all go in and they bathe and drink, etc. etc. And you can introduce interesting native wildflowers, so sort of cuckoo flower and things like that, or marsh marigold. Angelica is a nice one for a sort of shady, damp woodland edge. Um, and they are stunning. When they're in flower, they are absolutely marvellous. And they're really good for insects because they produce these big umbels of flowers. So does giant hogweed, but there are different issues with that. Uh, and then sweet sicily. Sweet sicily, I think, is a delightful flower. And yet, we have issues about native and non-native species, which is my background, my research background as an invasion biologist. Um, and we're very subjective about what we label as native and non-native. So we don't like Himalayan balsam, but we like sweet sicily. Hmm. It's invading along rivers and watercourses and roadsides and woodlands, but we like it. So I think there are issues with that and I think it's a lovely plant to grow. You just, again, you just have to be brutal with it because it will start to seed itself into the wrong places. Um, and the thing is, with gardening the nature of mind, we're not giving up on gardening. Because people think, oh, it's wildlife gardening, I just sit back and watch nature. Well, yeah, but I can tell you what you're going to get and it's not going to be particularly good. And I, I love this one. My wife can look away at this moment because she doesn't like it. Uh, it's a great willow herb. And I think it's a stunning flower. I think it's really, really nice. 
But because we lay this as a weed, a weed is merely a plant in the wrong place. And I think that's rather good. Isn't it? It's great for insects, I love it. And it's cousin roast a little bit. See, I don't know if I can hawk or speed on this, but one of my defining moments as, as a youngster getting interested in natural history was on what we used to call waste waste ground at Warminster Road in Sheffield before the road had been put through. Um, and one late evening we were there and looked at a patch of rose bay willow herb silhouetted against the sky and this thing on top of it. In fact no it was in a patch of willow but it was on a, on a, a wooden stump sticking up something like that against the, the sky and then this thing reared up at the top doing this. It's about that long. And we thought, what on earth? So we used to run off and then crept back to see what it was. And it was a caterpillar of an elephant hawk moth, which had obviously been on the willow and climbed up this stick and was then just sort of doing that. So they, they sort of tried to find out where they can go next. But we were terrified of it. <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's contact with nature. That, and that makes a difference to a kid or to an adult. It's wonderful. So that fits in, I think that fits in nicely with all the uh, exotic species. And you're trying to create this sort of vista. It should look really good. And the, the other thing that you're trying to do is to have a series of massed flowers that follows in a sort of succession right the way through the period. And the trick is to never have a period when you haven't got something in bloom. So you're looking at stuff probably from February, March, where the first thing's coming through right the way through now to September, October, there should be lots and lots of flowers in every patch. And obviously if you have one big stand of alliums, you need to think, well, what can I have that's going to be there before and what can I have that's going to come afterwards? So I'm planting with the alliums and then I've got these giant lilies that come up there, amazing things. They look really exotic, but they seem to bulk up quite quickly, so they're about this height. And they are wonderfully fragrant, but they're also brilliant for insects. They're really fantastic. And this allium, I can never remember which one it's, what its name is, but it's uh, very easy to grow. And the bees go ballistic for that. They love these hanging flowers. Uh, and you can grow that in amongst the other stuff. So it comes with flowers and then it's gone. And you just try and manage that sequence of things. Because you're trying to get habitat. You're trying to get stuff for the bees, nectar, pollen, you're trying to get stuff for the butterflies, the hoverflies, etc. And a lot of the things that are really good, it's not just the wildflowers, but the, the typical garden flowers, the old-fashioned, the Gertrude Jekyll type garden, garden cottage flowers, borage and stuff like that are fantastic for insects. Now the other thing is to think of the space that you're in. So you might be thinking about the area that you've got, but actually what you really need to think about is the volume and you can work vertically upwards, you can work up walls and fences and you can create. So you're looking at the garden in three dimensions and you're also trying to think about the time of day and where you plant for certain species at certain times, at different times of the year. So you have to think this through. It's quite strategic because if you want butterflies or if you want bees, you want the right plants in the right situation right the way through the period. So you need to think, well, where's the sun tracking around and where am I going to put my body or my honeysuckle or whatever? So I've got it in the morning, midday and the afternoon. So think about them. There's an example there. That's a cherry tree which we had in the middle. There's a little orchard like a lot of 1920s, 30s houses have got. But one of the trees has died there, but what I've done here, there's a cherry, and then I've grown a clematis uh, into that. So you've got more bang for your book. You get the cherry in flower, then the clematis. That provides cover for the breeding birds, etc., roosting birds, mainly pigeons, which is a damn nuisance. <laughs> and then you get the cherries, so the birds are feeding on the cherries as well. And you can do the same thing with other, other <coughs> flower species. And planting fast growing trees like native trees like uh, silver birch, field maple, rowan, they all start to give you a three dimensional space. But the trick is then to grow up 
into your birch tree or into your maple or into the hazel, um, honeysuckle and clematis as well. So you've got a series of things. You've got a tree and birch is wonderful in spring um, as is hazel for its uh, catkins and then for the seeds in the autumn and winter for the birds. You know, if you've got that you're going to get your long tail tips and stuff. But then also growing up honeysuckle, so you've got honeysuckle flowers and then by August in September you've got the honeysuckle berries. So you're thinking three dimensions, you're thinking aspect, you're thinking seasonality, etc. And you're thinking as a place, like I said, where our garden is, we're very fortunate now that we've got at least one badger set further down in the, the massive gardens that we've got. If that estate were being built today, there would probably got three roads on there. You know, there's a big issue about how we squeeze these things in. But because it's 1920s, there's plenty of space and it's quite secluded and most people seem really pleased to see the badgers uh, coming in. So you're thinking about connections, you're thinking about how you link to green spaces, your neighbours' gardens, you have to talk to your neighbours, exchange plants, encourage them to have a pond, all these sort of things. Um, no man is an island, or no person now is an island and themselves. So, yeah, that's the other one, you know, we've got buzzers coming up. We've got buzzers, we've got red kites, we've got peregrines. I've had a hobby fly over, I had an osprey fly over. So it's not just what you get in the garden, it's, it's what you also get over, which reflects the green space. And again, part of this is you need to think bigger than just your garden because you won't get the buzzers if there's nowhere for the buzzers to nest. So if you're really concerned about this, you need to be working with the Wildlife Trust and other organisations to make sure those green spaces are protected. Now I live to the south of the Gleadless Valley and there's a lovely historical connection here because the Gleadless Valley means Gled Lees, it's Old English or Old Welsh um, and it means the open area populated by red kites. <laughs> and we now have buzzers and red kites by. The kites aren't reading yet, but they will do. The next thing is that you can add things to the habitat. So you're creating habitats, but we can use what Chris Baines would describe as habitat supplements. Feeders, nesting sites, roosting sites, shelter, etc. And that might include things like bug boxes. You can either make these, which is really good fun, or you can now often buy them for, you know, two, three, four pounds from a lot of uh, retailers. With bug boxes, they are very useful. They will all have a, uh, a use and a complement of species uh, involved. But if you really want to get the solitary bees and things like that, and people like to have things like leaf cutter bees, which are the ones that leave you know, a really neat hole in your rose leaves, <laughs> and also have this amazing thing where they when you first see them, it looks like there's a piece of leaf flying it through the garden. This is really weird. Um, and the first time I saw that was at my parents' house at North Mays. And this thing was flying into the lock of our French windows. So you saw what appeared to be a leaf coming down the garden and heading straight for you. And it was actually building its nest inside the door. Um, to get the solitary bees, and you will get them, you need a sunny spot. That's it. You just need the bug box up there, and if you put it in a sunny spot, you will get it used. If you put it in a shady spot, you'll get some spiders and wood lice and a few things like that. And you can add a uh, hedgehog house if necessary. Uh, again, you can get these, you can get very expensive ones, or you can make very sophisticated ones. You can get quite low cost ones. Or you can just get a bunch of sticks. That works equally well. The main thing with a bunch of sticks, because nothing in my garden is not recycled, I've thrown very little away, if anything. Um, if you are from the gardening generation that likes to have a, an autumn and winter fire, then please make sure you have a hedgehog in that bundle of sticks before you <coughs> set fire to it, otherwise the hedgehog will have problems. And again, another form of common species now with a serious problem, but we can make a difference. Hedgehog houses, a brush pile of sticks uh, under some logs, 
can be fantastic. And then feeding them at night as well with hedgehog food. I put cameras out, when I put some hedgehog food out, and I then found I've got foxes, badgers, wood mice, and hedgehogs all eating hedgehog food. And little things like um, uh, bird baths, again, water, really, really important, particularly like last summer when we had the drought. The birds and the insects are desperate for water, so these will be used, they will be really important. Uh, and again, bird boxes, bat boxes, and the, the trick again with these is as, as many as possible in different places, bats are very fussy, and unlike the birds, they move from property to property. If the conditions change, humidity and temperature, they may move up sticks and move next door. So you need as many as you can get in different positions, and then you just wait and see what happens. Maximising natural foods, uh, berries, etc. Um, say more bang for your buck, thinking three dimensionally, growing things like honeysuckle into other climbers. So you've got a sequence of flowers, you've got a sequence of berries, um, and you've got fruit, seeds, berries, insects, worms, etc. So you're looking at maximising this through the period. Teasel is great because the flowers are wonderful. It's a biennial, so you, you need to grow them. Um, you know, you can, they, they're seeding to disturb ground, but then you can transplant the little seedlings and they'll flower the following year. Uh, but the flowers are wonderful. The flowers are great for butterflies, bees and hoverflies, and then the seed heads are brilliant for green finches and gold finches. And be imaginative as well. That, yes, that is one of our ringlet parakeets that we're not supposed to like because they're alien species. I quite like them. <coughs> now, what I do, we haven't got an apple tree anymore, but I spike apples onto the feeders, and the blue tits and blackbirds and parakeets are lovely. So, apple feeders, mealworm feeders are brilliant as well. Sunflower hearts. A few years ago, you put out an Niger seed for goldfinch, and they would immediately come onto it. They didn't have or eat it. Very fussy. They all only eat sunflower hearts. Even the parakeets, bless them, are eating sunflower hearts. Robins eat sunflower hearts. Blue tits, jackdaws, everything eats sunflower hearts. They are really expensive. <laughs> but the apples, you can get low cost apples. Or one of our neighbours very generously gives me a box of his windfalls. They're brilliant. Uh, and the birds will love them. And they're kind of there for a week or so at a time, so that's, that's continuity of food. Um, being a bit imaginative with mealworms, this is quite an expensive treat, so I don't do it all the time, but the starlings go absolutely ballistic for it. And I've got a little round feeder as well, I don't, I don't think I've included that in this. Um, and I put the mealworms in that, dried mealworms, and you'll get 20 starlings all trying to get onto the same feeder. Really quite exciting. We've got mammals coming into gardens. We haven't got this. Uh, in our garden, rhodium, we've got them in the woods opposite. And some of you may have seen the two clips, which are on my blog, I think, and possibly on my Twitter. Um, we had a clip of a rhodium going up the River Don a couple of years back. And so I actually filmed it near Kellam Island and put it out on social media. It got filmed by somebody else further down. Um, and it went global. It went, it went absolutely ballistic. Um, a male rhodia in the middle of Sheffield, in broad daylight, going up the River Don at one of the weirs. And then someone had one in a garden in Mearsbrook, down at Ely. And they were just in their kitchen, and then suddenly they saw a rhodia running across them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Which is why I say gardens are so important for people to uh, contact with nature. And there's my badger at night. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing. Now, I, I grew up as a kid, there were no badgers in Sheffield. They'd been hunted out, they'd been killed by badger deers and badger baiters. And we now got them coming into the garden. You have to manage them, that's a, for another talk, you have to manage your garden to make it badger proof, which is gently dissuading them coming and digging up my prize lilies and things. Uh, and you can do it. It's a carrot and stick. I've got little things that you use to ward, you know, to encourage cats not to go in your garden. Little plastic mats. Um, and then I feed them. So I draw them in with the carrot 
and then I try to encourage them not to go to certain other places. But it is fantastic when you get you know a couple in there at once, two or three in there at once sometimes. Really is amazing. And then there's the wooden house. So it's really good, you know, you get contact with nature, it may not be native, it may be exotic, but it's really good to see, it's really enjoyable. And you've got the amphibians this year when we did have frogs. And the dragon, dragonflies and damselflies are oh, amazing. And this is one of the groups along with some of the butterflies that will benefit from climate change. You know, hot summers. Except if you have a really long drought, they cause big problems for all the butterflies, for example. But it is, you know, in your garden and in your community green space, you can actually encourage these things, you can get access. Um, Budlia, you know, it's a fantastic plant. It is the second most damaging plant in terms of economic impact after Japanese knotweed. But it's a butterfly bush, we love it. So, I think they're fantastic. Um, and you can have uh, the Baina and the Lyrian and stuff like that, and you will get hummingbird birds. <coughs> I always get a few advice now. I've seen a hummingbird. No. <laughs> You've seen a whole lot and there we are, hummingbird, but they are fantastic things. And there's all the unseen nature, the fungi that actually make things happen, they make the ecosystem work. And they pop up in your meadows and grasslands. And of course, the unseen nature in the composting, because you should all be composting, of course you should. Uh, and that will be full of all sorts of insects and other invertebrates and earthworms. Um, and it's not, composting is not rocket science, you know, there's some very basic things that you do um, and once you've got the system going it will literally feed on itself, uh, so that's really good. And, you know, we are developing the trophic levels and this becomes very traumatic sometimes. These are the sparrowhawks that now visit and we had one that used to sit, as he does there, right next to the bird table, <laughs> below the top sideline of the hedge and just wait and lunch will come to me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I had, I had to move all the bits they could possibly perch on because I had one very traumatic thing and now this is me being sub subjected again. But we had a nut hatch that I was very fond of <laughs> and this nut hatch sort of flew to the feeder and then it was like something from one of those old cartoons. You but it was too late, it was a crab, but then the blooming sparrow sat there and plucked it for oh. <laughs> half an hour. So, but we're getting the food, you know, the food chains and the food, the trophic levels are rewilding. When I was a kid, we didn't have sparrow hooks. I remember the first time as a teenager we saw a sparrow hook in our bird watching group in the Rivlin Valley. That was a red letter day. You know, so to have them coming back and coming back into the arms is. Fantastic. It's not lazy gardening, it's gardening with a purpose. And who, you know, there's a jay coming in to feed on the feed on the on the fat balls there. So you're thinking, you know, how do I create habitat, how do I create space, how do I add to that? How am I going to bring the, the species in? And it's part of the nation, it's part of us, because it's just fantastic to see these things. You need to plan ahead, you need to think, you know, what do I do in the autumn and winter? to plan for next year, what worked, what didn't work. And sometimes it's a long term, you, you're growing, you know, you're not going to get something growing along the wall in a year, so you're having to actually probably cultivate a, se a sequence of um, interventions with the end in mind. And that's the sort of thing that you've got a nice sunny wall with, there's a bird feed, bird box behind that, there's a, um, actually a house sparrow bird box, but the blue tits are using it. And last year a tree bee used it, that's the exotic uh, little bee that's been colonising. Which was really strange, because when I went out at night to feed the badgers, I could hear this sort of electrical noise. I thought, well, it's one of the neighbours doing this, really weird. And it wasn't, you know, two houses away, it was right next to my head. There's the tree bees in their nest, keeping the constant temperature. So they're all in there, giving it whatever. It was very, very strange. 
And they were there for about a month and then they just disappeared. And there we are, yeah, there's the parent bird looking rather dishevelled and a very, very plump baby. That's probably full of my sunflower hearts. And that's really what it's all about. It's sort of feeling that you are facilitating that and you're part of that and you're privileged to have that connection. But it's also gardening for people. It's actually, you know, somewhere that you can be, that your friends and family and neighbours can be and can enjoy and take part in. So a few other do's and don'ts, that's the impact of peat cutting that, where the garden horticultural peat comes from, that's a 20th century peat processing area in Germany. That's a huge peat bulb completely mm -hmm. destroyed. So we need to deal with that. Uh, slugs and snails can be a problem. Uh, that's a really fantastic one, that's a great grey slug, that's a big choppy. They are rather fantastic and they're common in gardens and they mate from a, the hermaphrodite in the but they mate from a, a thread of um, mucus suspended from a branch or a wall or something about you know, a metre down. They are really quite exciting things. But we can deal with slugs with never slug. That's the easiest thing. It's quite expensive when you first get it. You water your garden with it and it has little parasitic nematodes and they will then in a rather gruesome way, parasitise the slugs and then they explode. But then you get more little nematodes. So that's an environmentally biologically friendly way of uh, keeping slugs and snails uh, under control. Think about climate. Um, forest bark is a fantastic thing to help hold water back, to maintain the garden during drought periods, but also to help hold the water when it floods. Um, and things like gravel and cobbles can also be really good. And increasingly, if we get long dry summers, um, there's lots of scope for doing uh, arid garden uh, areas. And I'd love to have space to do a thyme lawn where you actually grow thyme in the gravel. And that makes a really nice lawn, a little bit like walking on a limestone grassland. Then you get the smell and you get the flowers and everything. So there are loads of things that we can do like that. And we need to plan ahead for things like storm and tempest, rain and drought, to climate proof your garden, climate proof your neighbourhood. So, the other thing is trying to spread the message, getting more people involved. 15 million or more private gardens, that's a huge audience. We can actually change the world bit by bit. That's the theory I've got. This is where it all started in the Victorian period. People thought it, with the Victorian idea of austerity. Um, and everything being used to actually throw food out for the birds was considered outrageous. Um, and it began in London with the naturalist uh, W. H. Hudson recording it in the mid 1800s, and he moved to the southwest of England to uh, Cornwall, Devon, Cornwall, and he took his habit of throwing crumbs out to the birds with him. And the local people would come and sort of look and look at him and look at the food. <laughs> He's Londoners, they're very, very strange. <laughs> so it started, it's now a very sophisticated thing. You can potentially spend a lot of money, but you can also do it very, very low cost if you are a bit clever about it. And the, the great thing is bringing, you know, it's a benefit to nature, it's a huge impact on nature. But it's also really good for us, it's really good fun. You can add all these little bits, um, roosting site, uh, flowers for feeding, for pollen feeding, uh, butterflies, nest boxes. There's a baby woodpecker come down to our feeder. So that's what we're trying to see, it's creating an interface between you and nature, um, benefiting nature, benefiting us. And you're looking at trying to have something all year round, the numbers of birds obviously are greater in the winter, but you look at things like ivy, you know, if you want to just go cost or grow ivy, it's cheap, you watch free, you just go get a bit and plant it. Right? The same with buddleia. And people buy buddleia. You just get a stick and stick it in the ground. It's just strange. <laughs> um, but with ivy, you get the flowers, which are brilliant. Late summer, early autumn flowers, and then you get the berries, which are late autumn into winter. And the berries are often there 
after the other berries have been used up. And the birds overhead, I had two pairs of ravens flying around my house at the uh, rooftop level. This is a bird that was extinct regionally 20 years ago. It's just absolutely amazing. And they were looking for somewhere to roost nearby. So, you know, it's what's in the garden, how you maximise that. It's also when you're in the garden, what you see around. Uh, so this is just the last one here, <coughs> it is. So 30 years ago we had almost no badgers in the urban area. What do you use that to feed? <laughs> I use suet balls, little suet, they're like little, almost like a, um, a potato croquette type shape. Uh, and I love those. Along with, so I put some of those out and then I scatter some hedgehog food as well. And you can just see it there. It's got a big fat near end mm. and it waddles, probably because of the amount of suet balls it's been eating. <laughs> Uh, we're going to take a break and then I've got two quite